What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Also, make sure you hit that notification bell so you're always notified the next time I drop a video or go live. Today, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And over the years in the mafia, many of you have seen this individual, especially if you're taking a look at John Gotti content, one of the names most synonymous with the mafia in America. The John Gotti was known for a lot of things. One thing we would know about John Jackie Knows D'Amico, this guy, is that many people would say he was a lackey, he was an umbrella carrier, he was this, he was that. But in today's video, we're going to discuss and uncover how truly powerful at one point John Jackie Knows D'Amico was. In my opinion, he is one of the most underrated people in the history of this family. We're going to talk about his up and coming uh, career, his ultimate successful career, and his ability to essentially stay out of jail, even being connected to one of the most powerful people and most known people in the history of the mafia. The story of Jackie Knows D'Amico, next on Sit Down Shorts. John D'Amico was born on July 11th, 1937. His parents actually would hail from the southern Italian region of Campania. Now, Jackie Knows would actually grow up on the lower east side of Manhattan. A lot of people actually believe that in his later years and due to his relations with people from Brooklyn, many people actually believe that John D'Amico was from Brooklyn. He wasn't. In fact, Mikey Scars de Leonardo would say at one point that Jackie Knows didn't know anything about Brooklyn. He couldn't tell you the difference between Bath Beach and other areas of Brooklyn. He was a guy who later in his life became someone who was a bon vivant, knew a lot of different people. But he actually would spend most of his formidable years and most of his grown years on the lower and then eventually upper east sides. Now, Jackie Knows in the early 60s would become an associate of the Gambino crime family. In his early years, Jackie was very known and become very known in the gambling and bookmaking areas and was involved with card games as well. He became a decent earner. And when we're talking about Jackie Knows and, and really this part of the Gambino family, it's important that we understand a little bit of the history of the Gambino crime family. The Gambino crime family was started as the Diaquila or the Daguila family, however you pronounce it. Um, Toto Daguila uh, was the patriarch of the family at one point, way before it was the Gambino crime family. He would be murdered. Um, he would have a son called Jerry Mummy uh, Daguila, Jerome Jerry Mummy Daguila. In the late 50s and early 60s, Jerome Daguila would uh, step down as a capo in the Gambino crime family. Eventually, a person called Olympio Lilo Garofalo would take over that crew in the early 60s. Now, Lilo Garofalo goes back many years as well in the mob, and he forms and continues to run a very powerful crew in the Gambino crime family. Lilo Garofalo uh, was in and around Manhattan. He also had many people in Brooklyn as well. Lilo Garofalo ran out of this pastry shop most of his operations uh, in and around 1st Avenue and East 11th Street in the East Village, right near the Lower East Side. And this is where Jackie Knows becomes connected with the American Mafia. He becomes an associate of the family. Now, Lilo Garofalo would have a pretty powerful crew that he essentially ran out of this bakery. Members of the crew included Peter Freya, Paul Pauli Zach Zacharia, and Vincent Jimmy D. Leonardo, the grandfather of Michael Mikey Scars D. Leonardo. We'll talk a little bit more 
about Mikey Scars later in this video. Now, D'Amico, as I said, operated mostly in bookmaking and gambling, but there are uh, known connections to him in the jewelry world as well. He was pretty plugged in to the Diamond District and places like that. Now, one thing we would learn about Jackie Nose really by the late 60s and early 70s, he was becoming very connected in the gambling world. He was running gin rummy games. He was making connections that would really suit him later in his life. And we'll explain why in a bit. Now, in a 1999 New York Magazine article about legendary poker player Stu Unger, we would learn a little bit more about uh, the mafia and his their role in card games, really, on the Upper East Side during that time. According to the article about Stu Unger, Unger's connection to the mafia was through a person called Victor Romano, a very low-key, unknown Genovese soldier. Now, Victor Romano had a social club on the Upper East Side called the Joliet uh, Social Club. In the New York Magazine article, it would be referenced that at one point, one of the people that was seen a lot at that social club was Jackie Knows D'Amico. And it was said that there was possibilities that one of the gin rummy games that Stu Unger was actually playing in was run by Jackie Knows D'Amico. These connections were very important because he was able to meet bookies and, 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 and casino owners and all sorts of very powerful people that would suit Jackie Nose down the road. By the late 70s, Jackie Nose had become very synonymous with the Lilo Garofalo crew, and he would be proposed for membership into the Gambino crime family. Also, another associate who was from Brooklyn that would become made and promoted by Garofalo was actually Michael Mickey Boy Paradiso, another associate who began his career in the Lilo Garofalo crew. Now, this is where I believe where it's likely that Jackie knows meets John Gotti. If you know anything about Paradiso, he was from Canarsie. He was connected with certain people from Brooklyn. Um, and he was obviously connected with the Gambinos inside the Manhattan Garofalo crew. And it's likely where his friend Gotti meets D'Amico. This is probably around the same time. So kind of a little lay of the land where the Gambinos were in the early 70s to the late 70s. Now, as we know, in the late 70s, early 80s, John Gotti is planning his takeover of the Gambino crime family. In 85, he obviously takes out or has Paul Castellano taken out at Spark Steakhouse in Manhattan. Now, upon him taking over the family in early January 1986, John Gotti is doing some cleaning up of the family, if you will. He's inserting people that he wants in his captain's. He's demoting people. He's making new people. He's kind of making the family his. And in a wiretap conversation he is having with a member of the family, George Remini, he discusses in the wiretap that by this point, Lilo Garofalo, who is still alive, is a captain in the family. He's very sick, and he has a request for who to take over his crew. Now, remember, he had been a capo since the early 60s. And John talked very nicely about Lilo Garofalo, that he was a nice old man and that he wanted to honor the wish that Lilo had. One of the wishes that old man Garofalo had was he did not want Paul, Paulie, Zach, Zacharia to take over his crew, which we don't exactly know why. And I'm sure, and I'd love to know, maybe Mikey Scars can tell us at some point, because he would identify in his testimony that Paulie, Zach, was actually Mikey Scar's mentor at one point and taught him a lot about the mafia. I would love to know why he didn't want Paulie Zach to take over his crew because Paulie Zach had been connected with that crew for a while, and it's unknown as to why he didn't want Paulie Zach in. So John Gotti wants to give Garofalo what he wants. Garofalo would eventually pass away. And to be honest, interestingly enough, in late 86, Zacharia would actually take over as capo. At one point in the discussion, Gotti says that he wants to insert Michael Paradiso as the new capo. Capo uh, being the fact that Paradiso was in jail up until that point and that Gotti would wait until he gets out and we'd insert Mickey as capo. 
That didn't happen. Zacharia would take over, but it was only for a short time. Eventually, in 1989, Jackie knows would actually take over the old Lilo Garofalo crew. And this is where Jackie knows D'Amico becomes part of John Gotti's inner circle. This is where we see him at the Ravenite constantly. We see him always in constant contact with Gotti. This is where he becomes powerful in the family. And remember, he's a capo at this time. The one thing that I think made John D'Amico so close with John Gotti, if you talk to people that actually knew Jackie knows, they would tell you that the one big thing that people get wrong about Jackie was he was a degenerate gambler. Many will actually tell you that it wasn't necessarily the fact that he was a, gen, a, gen, a degenerate gambler like John. It was that he knew so many people that went back years in that world, whether it was bookies or 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 um, people that could lay off bets or, or whatever, you know, uh, loan sharks, whatever. Jackie knows knew the people, and he was the conduit that John had. They had the affinity both for the gambling world, and John needed Jackie to scratch that itch, if you will, put his bets in, collect for him, give money for him, all that sort of thing. I think that's what made John like Jackie so much. And because Jackie was loyal, right? John didn't have to worry about Jackie doing anything to hurt him. Jackie saw the power that John had and they were close. Now there are tons of wiretaps where John berates Jackie knows constantly. I mean, talks down to him. But there's one thing about Jackie knows that you have to respect. He was very loyal. And we're going to talk about later in life how Jackie knows didn't only need John Gotti to survive. He was definitely brought up and elevated because of John Gotti. But as I've said before, he was very connected before he even knew John Gotti. And he was very connected after he knew John Gotti. Now, several of the people that John Gotti would use as bookmakers, including Little Dom Cura were actually created and curated through Jackie Nose D'Amico. Things were good for Jackie Nose. He was a high-ranking member of the Gambino crime family. He was in the inner circle of John Gotti. Um, now, people that know him would say that John D'Amico would actually uh, have an apartment in Manhattan, but that his actual family was based in New Jersey. And they would say that every Sunday... Jackie Nose would spend his Sundays with his family, which is a pretty known tradition in the Italian culture. John D'Amico would also get a no-show job, which every good gangster has. In 1991, he would become affiliated with a company called Big Geyser Incorporated. Now, according to uh, Google, Big Geyser is a family-owned and operated business that has been distributing non-alcoholic beverages and snacks in the New York area for over 35 years. Now, John D'Amico would be connected to Big Geyser through an individual called Irving Hershkowitz. Now, Irving Hershkowitz claims that he'd known D'Amico for 30 years and that he offered in 1991, out of the blue, John D'Amico a salesman job. Um, now, we would find out down the road that essentially he never sold anything for Big Geyser. This was a no-show job. Uh, for Jackie Knows D'Amico. In 1991, it was uncovered that his starting salary was about $24,000, which in inflation is about $53,000 today. Now, also, I'm sure that John D'Amico didn't care much about the salary. He was making money everywhere else, but it was a nice chunk of money he would get every two weeks. And he had health insurance. He had benefits. And most importantly, he had a job on paper that he could show the federal government. Now, one fringe benefit that John D'Amico would also get was he'd be provided with a shiny red Jaguar. Now, if you look into the ownership of the Jaguar, it was registered to Big Geyser Inc. Now, at one point, Irving Hershkowitz would be pressed about why John Jackie Knows D'Amico was driving a $100,000 Jaguar registered to his firm. Hershkowitz would respond, quote, he's a salesman of ours. He's been one for about three years. He works on commission. I've known him 30 years. He's a lifelong friend. We went to high school together. Now, there is no known proof that Hershkowitz and Jackie Nose went to high school together. My guess is 
it's just a way to insulate and pretend that they knew each other for all this time. Jackie knows uh, D'Amico during and around the early 90s. The one thing we would know him most for was his appearances at John Gotti's trial in 1992. He would be regularly seen walking into court, talking to reporters, and he talked very openly about his involvement with Mr. Gotti. I think one thing that I'm always so fascinated by with Jackie knows is the amount of times, the amount of video and audio and photos we have of Jackie knows in constant contact with Gotti, and he's not hemmed up in this. It's pretty incredible. All the people involved with Gotti, all the people that are seen with him that were jammed up for being connected to him, Jackie knows maintained, you know, kind of off that radar. I want to talk a little bit about his comments to reporters about Gotti during this time. At one point, John D'Amico would have a legendary quote about Gotti saying, quote, a John Gotti only comes along once in a life. He had two things going for him. He was loved and feared. He's the only person I've seen with both. You call it charisma? He has that. But love and fear was what counted. People don't cross a man they love and fear. Now, Jackie Knows would also say about Gotti, quote, as to why he was at the trial, he's my friend and I love him. Now, a reporter would also press Jackie Knows about his affiliation with Gotti and the mafia. D'Amico would respond with, quote, they are assuming it's mostly hearsay. And they were doing the old school gangster thing. There is no mafia. I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that. It's fascinating. The writing's on the wall. But uh, I might have stole the church, but there's no proof of it. Even as Scotty Jr. would say, it's sticking out of his backside. Deny, deny, deny. And that's what's so funny about people like Jackie Knows. Truly fascinating guy. Now, as we know, Gotti would become incarcerated for life and he was off the streets. But for John Jackie Knows D'Amico, this is really where his career continues to burgeon. By this point, Jackie Knows is becoming very close with some young people in Brooklyn by this point. And this is one thing that is so important about the evolution of what the the Gambino family becomes after Gotti. Because as we know, Junior takes over, Peter takes over. John D'Amico is still in the hierarchy of the family. But what he's doing is he's sowing the connections and conduits to down the road what this family is going to look like. We're going to rescue it. We're going to go away from the Gotti regime, and we're going to institute strong people. Now, one of the people Jackie knows is very close to and sees a future to is Francesco Frankie Boy Cali. One of really, in my opinion, the most connected, strong individuals ever associated with the mob over the last 10 to 20 years is Frank Cali. Incredibly gifted individual in the mob world. Incredibly. Very connected. John D'Amico takes him under his wing. And Frank Cali would actually begin as a driver for Jackie Knows D'Amico. At one point in the late 90s, the federal government would allege that Cali alongside D'Amico were actually involved in a multi-million dollar phone card scheme where they made tens of millions of dollars through illegal phone cards. I'm not going to go into that whole thing. If you've ever seen Sopranos season two, the scheme was very similar to the one that Tony, Big Pussy, and uh, several other people were involved in with Indian gangsters. Um, a very similar scheme. Cali and D'Amico were really sowing the future up in the family. And this is where the bridge between the Gotti regime and the new regime that we're going to talk about comes. And this is where the present day Gambino family was created, essentially. And we don't give D'Amico the credit for And I know several other great YouTubers have done that, including RJ and several others. They all have kind of their opinions on all this. I think the one thing we can all agree on is if you just say Jackie Knows was Gotti's umbrella guy, 
I just don't think you know that much. I don't think you're giving him his due diligence, his respect. He was so much more before and after that. We also look at once Jackie Nose takes over, the strength the family has. Ultimately, in 1999, Jackie Nose D'Amico would be arrested in a racketeering case. The feds would allege that he was running a gambling racket out of the state of Connecticut. He would ultimately do 17 months for his behavior in that crime. He would get out in late 2001 and head back to the streets. Now, as we know, in the early 2000s into 2005, the regime of Gotti Jr. and Gotti Sr. and Peter Gotti was essentially ending. The acting boss of the family was a person called Arnold Zeke Squitieri. I've done a video on Zeke, definitely a formidable individual and really calmed the waters after Peter Gotti. He would be arrested in 2005. At that point, the boss of the Gambino crime family was John Jackie Nose D'Amico. And this is where the family continues to strengthen and strengthen and strengthen. Frank Cali would take over the old D'Amico crew. And the new underboss of the family on an acting basis was Dom, Italian Dom Schaefalu, an old school Sicilian gangster with plenty of ties to the old country. D'Amico sowed, sowed the seeds in this family. And if you look at the undercover photos, Callie, D'Amico, Shafalu, um, they were regularly in contact with each other. By this point as well, John and Joe Gambino were out of prison. They were given strength and roles in the family. The Gambino crime family was heavy and it was powerful again. Really, it hadn't been that powerful since the late 80s, early 90s. The Gotti regime was over, and the D'Amico regime had started. If you say D'Amico wasn't powerful, I ask you, how did all these people come connected together? Jackie knows. He was the conduit. He recognized the future of the family was in the old world Sicilians. And we also have to give credit to people like Bobby Glasses, Bernice who was from Sicily. He connected a lot of these people. These guys were so powerful in making the family, you know, kind of the lowest level with Junior and Peter in making it what it was again. Ultimately, though, sad news would come to Jackie Nose D'Amico. In 2008, he would be jammed up in a very powerful case, according to the federal government, called Operation Old Bridge. He would be released on bail in March of 2008. And essentially, the federal government was trying to get Jackie Nose uh, to plead guilty to extortion, which he would in May of 2008 and be sentenced to two years in federal prison. Now, John D'Amico would be scheduled for release in late 2009. That wouldn't happen, though. Several months before his release, he would be thrown into an, an indictment that happened way back in 1989, involving the murder of Staten Island businessman Fred Weiss. Now, we've talked about the Fred Weiss killing. Um, the government would contend that the old adage for the government is, if we can't get someone on murder, we'll just connect them to the murder and give them conspiracy to commit murder. Now, if you know anything about the Fred Weiss plot, there were like two or three different plots and like, if anyone picked up the phone and said the name Fred Weiss, they were thrown into the indictment. Now, the government would contend that the case against D'Amico was incredibly weak. So what they do is say, you know what? Let's split the baby here. We're not going to take this to trial because we could win. Let's just offer you a couple of years. You want to take three years on attempted assault? And John D'Amico says, you know what? F it. I'll put this case behind me. I'll cop to your corny con your, your corny uh, charge here and I'll go to jail, right? I don't want to deal with this anymore. So John D'Amico goes to jail and he's out in under three years. Jackie knows would be released in June of 2012. Since then, he has been pretty quiet. It's 10 plus years later and we haven't heard much from Jackie knows. He would turn up in this photo in and around 2022 at a wedding in New Jersey. 
from what I understand, Jackie Nose is pretty much retired. And he's living his life in relative anonymity. He is 85 years old. And I will say to him as well, I turned 34 on July 10th. Jackie Nose turns 86 on July 11th. We essentially share a birthday. I will say this, and I don't know if Jackie watches this stuff, but I hope he takes this video not as disrespect. Hopefully, it's just a history. Jackie Nose really gets a bad rap in the history of the mafia. He, I think, is supremely misunderstood. He led a very interesting life and a very connected life before he met John Gotti and really acted as a conduit to what makes the family today what it still actually is, a pretty powerful group. The mafia isn't what it used to be, but there was a short time where Jackie Knows created a pretty powerful group and rescued it from pretty rough waters in the late 90s. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.